Violinist.com interview with Baroque violinist Stanley Ritchie Before the chin rest November 19, 2012, 3.51 p.m. Have you been secretly wishing to shed both your shoulder rest and chin rest? Here is your friendly, expert guide, Baroque violinist and Indiana University professor Stanley Ritchie, in his new book, Before the Chin Rest. For me, Professor Ritchie's book read like a novel, fully delivering on its cover's promise to reveal the mysteries of pre-chin rest technique and style. It has that air of revelation, with each page putting a new historical spin on ideas I've taken for granted my entire musical life. Even if you, like I, have no intention of ditching your chin rest or shoulder rest, the combination of history, practicality and sheer love for Baroque music is both enlightening and inspiring. No skimming, I read it fully, with a pencil in hand, and left it full of marks and notes. Ritchie argues that he has gained a profound sense of freedom in going without the chin rest and shoulder rest. In fact, that sense of freedom is also what made him embrace the early music movement, which was just making its way from Europe to the United States when he discovered it in the 1970s through his colleague Albert Fuller, to whom his book is dedicated. Before he went Baroque, I couldn't resist, Ritchie was a successful, modern, violinist. Born in Australia, Ritchie graduated from the Sydney Conservatorium of Music in 1956. He then studied in Paris with Jean Fournier, then in the United States with Joseph Fuchs, Oscar Shumsky and Samuel Kissel. He went on to serve as concertmaster of the New York City Opera in 1963, then associate concertmaster of the Metropolitan Opera from 1965 to 1970. In 1970 he joined the New York Chamber Soloists, then in 1973 played as assistant concertmaster of the Vancouver Symphony until 1975, when he became first violinist in the Philadelphia String Quartet, in residence in the University of Washington in Seattle. He joined the Indiana University School of Music in 1982 as Professor Violin, and has served in that capacity ever since. Last month I spoke over the phone with Ritchie about how the early music movement changed his life, about playing without a chin rest or shoulder rest, and about how his book clears up some misconceptions people might have about period performance. Here's the interview. What made you want to take up the violin in the first place? I was born in New South Wales, Australia, in a farming community where there was no live music of any kind. My mother used to listen to the radio, so I was always listening to classical music, even though it was canned. But she wanted me to have music lessons of some sort. When I was seven, my parents took me to the city for the first time. And as we were walking down the street in the city, I saw a violin in a shop window. I pointed at it and said, I want that. They discussed it and said, well, it's cheaper than a piano. So that was it. I took violin lessons at the local convent, the only place to take violin lessons. I had eight years of ladies all but one of whom knew nothing about the violin at all. But why did I take up violin and make it my life? When I graduated from high school, I had a scholarship that would have taken me three years at a university, undergrad and everything. I stood on the grounds of the university with my mother, looking around me, tossing between going there or to the conservatorium to take music lessons. I chose the conservatorium for two reasons. A. I was scared of the university, overawed by the whole thing. And B. Subconsciously, I think, to please my mother. That's how I became a violinist. Not driven from the age of three to be the greatest violinist in the world. How old were you when you started, then? Almost eight. What made you fall for Baroque music? I guess the seed, the germ of it, was planted by a question that always appeared in a written exam we had to take to graduate from the Sydney Conservatorium of Music. What is meant by style in music? And so we thought about it. 
Whatever we came up with, at least we began to think about it. Then I came to the United States several years later, in 59, to the School of Music at Yale. I thought about doing a master's degree, then decided it wasn't the kind of thing I wanted to do, but one course really got my attention, that was performance practice, a term that I'd never heard before. I took the course, which was taught by the late David Crahenbell, who was a wonderful, wonderful professor. He really opened my eyes, all of ours, to the difference between certain things we took for granted in performance style, and what might have been the truth. At that time, I was listening to the music of Heinrich von Biber, a late 17th century German composer whom I'd never heard of before. We all thought violin music started with Corelli. Ten years later, after I'd finished my studies, and after I'd freelanced in New York and played with the New York City Opera and the Met, I joined a chamber group called the New York Chamber Soloists. The harpsichordist was Albert Fuller, who had been teaching at Juilliard for 40 years. We were concertizing, and one day, on the way back from an out-of-town performance, I said, Albert, I'd really like to know more about Baroque music, could we get together and read a sonata or two sometime? And Albert grabbed me and said, when, because nobody had ever asked him that before, no freelance violinist in New York at the time would think such a thing. When we got together, he said, do you know what they're doing in Europe now? They're tuning their violins a down half step down, they're putting on gut strings and they're playing with old bows. I said, why would they want to do that? And he said, well, why don't you try it? So I tried tuning my violin a half step down. And there I was, using a modern bow on loose strings, it was not the greatest fun I'd ever had. Still, he was very persuasive. I had an old Tyrolean violin in the closet that wasn't being used, and we found someone to convert it back to its original condition. And so, I finally had a Baroque instrument. Well, a little hybrid. It was late 17th century instrument, with classical fittings, and borrowed a Dodd bow from Jacques Francais and had Bill Salcho make a copy. This was 1971. Had you taken your chin rest off at this time? Yes, I took it off. I had already managed without my shoulder rest, by putting some sponge or foam rubber or something on the back of the instrument. That gradually condensed over a period of six months. By the end of that time, I didn't need a shoulder rest anymore. And then the idea of going without the chin rest came. I remember meeting Gustav Leonhardt after a year or two of playing Baroque. Of course I was still making a living playing modern violin, because you couldn't playing Baroque violin. He spotted the mark on my neck, and he said, ah, you mustn't play with a chin rest. Do you still use a shoulder rest for modern playing? I don't need it. When I'm playing modern violin I hardly even use the chin rest now. There's a raging debate about shoulder rests that happens from time to time on Violinist.com. People get almost moralistic and crazy about it. Not using either, all I can say is this, people use shoulder rests because they feel that they need it. But I had a student who is well over six feet tall, with a long neck, and who is now a very successful concertizing Baroque violinist. He doesn't use a chin rest or a shoulder rest, and what he does is quite amazing. So it must be possible for anybody to do it. As I say, I'm much shorter, I'm a good 6 to 9 inches shorter than that man, and it's probably much more comfortable for me. It depends on the physique of the individual, and also someone's ability to relax, not hold onto the violin or shoulder rest as though it were a clutching blanket. A lot of people raise their shoulder under the instrument, they're so afraid of dropping it, which is exactly what one should not do. It sounds like you have to change your technique to make it work properly. Absolutely, of course. If you ditch your shoulder rest and your chin rest and you don't change the technique, it's pointless because the instrument is going to be clamped like a vice. The whole point of playing without the chin rest and keeping your shoulder down is so that the instrument can resonate like a bell. Whereas if you raise your shoulder, you're clamping. As long as the instrument is in contact with the shoulder, there is a certain dampening effect. People have all kinds of crazy ideas about the period performance movement. 
As a pioneer in this movement, what kinds of misconceptions would you like to clear up for people? I, for one, am not a flag-waving evangelist about this. I do it because it feels much more natural to me, and I think that's what it should be about trying to make music in the most natural way. After all, the period instrument and early instrument movement has reached all the way into the 20th century now, from before Mozart, all the way up to Wagner and Mahler. One of the misconceptions might be that it's very snobbish or elitist. I wouldn't doubt there are people who are that way, but as a movement, its purpose is far from just trying to be better than everybody, but ideally to find out for oneself how music was approached at the time it was written. Any music, all music, then of course, there are all sorts of misconceptions such as, you mustn't vibrate when you play early music. That is utter nonsense. The kind of vibrato that you describe in the book sounds like a really subtle kind of vibrato, but it is vibrato. I guess we can just clear that up right here. Was vibrato used in Baroque music? The misconception about vibrato is that you don't vibrate when you play Baroque music. This is only true in Baroque orchestral music, you don't do it in orchestral music. Nor should a cellist who is playing continuo vibrate, because it confuses the pitch, and it makes the music expressive in the wrong way. But on the other side, there's the idea that constant vibrato is the way to play. I don't know when this idea started, well I have an idea, it was sometime in the 20s when it became more general practice. And that is demonstrably incorrect, stylistically. We have lots of evidence, not only from what Leopold Auer said, but others as well. Besides, in performing parts from the 19th century, you can find where they would vibrate, it was like any other ornament. I always say to people, constant vibrato is similar to trilling all the time. If you trilled on every note, people would think you're crazy. If you vibrated all the time in the 1700s and 1800s, people would think you were crazy. So vibrato was more like an ornament? Oh very much so. Plenty of teachers tell their students, the more vibrato, the better. They tell them to develop a continuous vibrato, maybe you need that for the brook? One of my colleagues certainly insists on it. He doesn't like to hear the violin played without vibrato. And he's somebody I respect very highly. One person, one musician, we really don't see eye to eye on this subject. What made you decide to write this book, to put it all down? It started, actually, with the sets of exercises that are at the back of the book. I had developed those exercises over the years for teaching intonation, and one of my doctoral students decided to use Sibelius to write them out. So at first, I wrote some annotation and started to write a few things down about how to use the exercises, then some ideas about intonation and left-hand technique. And I put it out, desk published it, as something called the Violinist's Left Handbook. The next step was writing something for the right hand and exercises for the bow, and I called that the Violinist's Right Handbook. Then a few years ago I had a sabbatical, holed up in a nice little village in northern Italy, and set to work putting it all together and adding an introduction and a chapter or two on interpretation. Essentially, it's a distillation of my teaching methods. It's certainly the direction I've taken my students over the last 30 years. They've taught me, it's what I've learned from them that I've put down in this book. I think people get very intimidated by all the rules of Baroque music. For me, even just thinking of the treatise by Leopold Mozart is intimidating. People think, if I play Bach, I don't know what people will say about it, because I don't know if I'm going to follow the rules right. That's one of the side effects of the whole movement. There's much more interest about the way they played Bach. There's so much more information out there now than there was when I was a student. If people are at all curious, at least questioning the things they've been taught, there's a lot to find out. Curiosity is what got me into early music. It seems to me that it's possible to be pretty free once you know some of this stuff. Absolutely. It's liberating, that's one emotion I really experienced when I took up Baroque violin. After playing so many years professionally as a violinist, I found playing Baroque violin akin to driving a sports car. 
I felt physically liberated and then eventually as I became more used to it, expressively liberated. As for rules, I think we are saddled with at least as many rules in traditional classical upbringing. That's one nice thing about 17th century music, there is no tradition that you can feel you're breaking. Therefore, when we approach music that's new to us, music that is not handed down by the traditional classical establishment, we feel we can experiment, try different ways of interpreting. I always tell my students, the last thing in the world that I want you to do when you come out of here is be a clone of me. I want you to come out of here finding your own way, asking questions, and putting it all together for yourself. Too often, when I hear people playing, they seem bound to a tradition, to the way their teacher taught them, and lacking spontaneity. Wasn't there a lot of improvisation in Baroque music, anyway? Absolutely. But it's something that's not taught any longer, and sometimes people are even discouraged from doing it, in modern training, which is terrible. When I first started improvising, I was playing a Corelli sonata using the 1713 edition's embellishments, which may or may not have been Corelli's. I tried those, and then, after a while, I thought, I don't like that one, I'm going to change it a little, and, there's nothing here, why shouldn't there be something similar? And so on. But the art of improvising is not something that just happens, it's learned, too. One of the greatest improvisers today is Robert Levin, the pianist, who improvises Mozart concerto cadenzas. He's not improvising in the sense of making it up from nothing. He's tried many things and has a storehouse of different possibilities. As he goes along, he chooses one from here, one from there, and so on, and puts them together. Jazz players' improvisation is a learned skill. They're not just doing it off the top of their head. I sat in for a couple sessions of Dave Baker's jazz improvisation course, and it was amazing, it's just very complicated. He's a wonderful teacher, but it was much too fast for me. There were books on how to improvise, certainly, from the end of the 16th to the beginning of the 17th century, showing you how to get from one note to another, and how many different ways, on one page, you can go, say, from E to F, about 20 different ways to get there. So they were certainly doing it 400 years ago. Oh my gosh, yes. I think we have a misconception about that as well. Sometimes we feel as though we know everything because it's the 21st century. I suggest we've forgotten an awful lot. For example, the 18th century people could teach us quite a lot about intonation. When you open Francesco Gemignani's Art of Playing on the Violin, the second thing he does, after the first page, is chromatic scales. We're raised, as modern players, on equal temperament and on so-called expressive intonation. But, as Gemignani demonstrates, when you play pure intervals, you realize that F-sharp is actually lower than G-flat. A flat is higher than G-sharp. I talk about this in my book. You can really figure it out pretty easily by using pure intervals. We have to use pure intervals on the violin. However, to do so, we must play on strings tuned in narrow fifths, we have to. So people are confused because, using expressive intonation, you're taught to push sharps up and pull flats down. This is what I call horizontal intonation. But when playing in a string quartet or orchestra, this kind of intonation doesn't work. One has to use pure intervals or vertical intonation in order to be in tune with other players. Every interval's out of tune on the piano except the octave. As string players, we don't have to play that way. Anyway, the overall misconception that I'm talking about is the idea that people back then didn't know as much as we do. Baroque music can even be kind of dissonant, with some really interesting harmonies. Oh yes, tremendously. Musicians at that time were much more aware of dissonance and consonance and their significance than we are today. In the book, you say that there is no such thing as unaccompanied music. Well, absolutely. When you are playing unaccompanied music, you are your own accompanist, and so you're playing the bass line. In other words, you can extract the bass line from any unaccompanied piece. This is relevant when we talk about breaking chords, as I do in the book. In the book I talk about different ways players break chords. 
When you are playing unaccompanied music, you are your own accompanist, and so you're playing the bass line. If you break the chords before the beat, then the bass note comes before the beat. But the bass is the beat. How would you feel if your accompanist on the piano were a little bit ahead of you all the time? It sort of puts you out at sea, rhythmically. And when you place the bass note on the beat, it actually makes a chord easier to play. You don't have to rush to get the other notes. The sense of time is a fascinating thing in the Bach unaccompanied. People forget, you're not on the metronome, you're not on the clock. Rubato is something that was talked about by Frescobaldi in the preface to his Toccatas in 1615. He said you must let the music go forward, then fall back, and wait, and so forth. So the idea of rubato in music is ancient, by the time Bach came around it was at least 100 years old. Rubato is a very Baroque concept, it's not something that happened with Liszt. Or Fritz Chrysler or something. One of the things we lost, we've forgotten in our training, is that it's not only possible and desirable to be free in this way, but it's also a type of expression. Rubato is a way of making the music more flexible and more natural. One of the important things that the early music movement has done is to raise awareness of the rhetoric, the declamation, and the affect, or emotional message, of each piece, and each part of each piece. For example, let's take Bach. When you're playing the unaccompanied pieces from the original, or from an urtext, there are no expression marks, none is written in. But they're really all there, in the harmony. Yes, there's rubato, yes, there's punctuation, yes, there's hesitation. They're all there, if you are aware of the significance of the harmonies, where something finishes, where something starts. There are places in Bach that are ambiguous, too, which you could read one way or the other. That's the nice thing about much of his music, you don't have to play it the same way twice. 